use Excel to create our distribution table for us, okay? Now, initially, you guys might argue, because you're unfamiliar with Excel, and I'm gonna try to teach you little things as we go through, okay? Um, but you're gonna say, well, I would rather do this by hand, which I can, I can agree with that, but my hope is that you can see that if you develop a proficiency with this, it becomes so much easier to use. And, and in statistics, a lot of times, we want to be efficient. We want to use programs that are going to do this type of stuff for us so that we can spend time analyzing, interpreting, and that kind of thing instead of sitting down and doing the, the kind of the rote arithmetic computations. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I put this data. What we need is they call us an array. Okay? A-R-R-A-Y. I gave you this array of data. Okay? Um, I think the story that they come from is that these are like prices of 30 GPS systems, okay? Um, but we wanna come up with the class limits, okay? Upper and lower, okay? We wanna come up with midpoints, frequency, relative frequency, cumulative frequency. And we wanna do this as efficient as possible, all right? Um, so I wanna use seven classes. Um, so we are going to figure out what the class width is, okay? So what I want you guys to do, we're gonna take, since we're gonna do seven classes, uh, we're going to, I'm just gonna highlight right now, you guys don't have to highlight, um, but I'm going to, I mean, you can if you want, I guess. I'm gonna just do it like green like that, and then we will do all borders. Um, I'm just gonna, because there's gonna be calculations that I ask, uh, to for the uh, for Excel to do, but I don't want them in anything that's green because everything that's in green is going to be replaced with something that's modeling our data or comes from our data. Um, so one thing I want to do is I want to find class width. That's the that's one of the first things that we need to do. So I'm going to just come down here um, to put my cursor. And the way we I don't know, I'm going to kind of assume that we don't know anything about Excel. Okay. Um, so right now, the way we identify the location of a cell is what I guess what column it is versus what row it's in. So this is this would be column B, row 10. So we call this B10. Okay. So we we'll come down to B10. I'm just going to type in class width. Okay. And then equals. And I want to figure out what is my class width going to be. So if you remember from last week, you take the largest value that is in your data, you subtract from it the smallest data that's in, or smallest value that's in your data, and then you divide by how many classes you had, right? So in our notes last week, it was range divided by number of classes, okay? So, um, we're going to look through our raw data. There's, there's some quicker ways of doing this, but since we've only got 30 pieces of data, it shouldn't be too difficult. Okay. What is the smallest piece of data in there? Is it 59? Is there anything less than 59 in there? And what is the largest? Four fifty. Okay, we can actually type in, so I want, if we struggle with this, I can go equals max, and then all I've got to do is go A2, because that's, see how that puts me at, it highlights that uh, cell right there, and if I hit colon, and then go down to A31, it's going to highlight that entire array, which is just another way of saying a list of data, and I hit enter, it gives me the max back. Okay, if I hit equals and then type in the phrase MIN and do the same thing, A2 to A31, hit enter, gives me back my minimum. See how nice that is? And I don't have to search. Think about having 10,000 pieces of data, okay? Would that be a nightmare to search through all 10,000 pieces of data and find the smallest one and then find the largest one? And think about your data being um, 
maybe continuous where you've got a bunch of decimals and stuff like that that you have to compare. Uh, that's an approach that might be a little bit easier. So what I'm going to do now is over here in this cell C10, I'm just going to identify what my class was. So this here, the way I've done this, uh, and you can do it a couple different ways, but I've just created class width as an ad identifier here. And then here, I'm going to actually ask it to find the class width. So um, lots of different ways we could do this. We can, because I've got 450 and 59 there, you can actually type in equals and then 450 minus 59 and then divide by 2. Okay, you can do that. Or not 2, 7, because we're going to use 7 classes, sorry. Um, you can do it that way. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to say equals, and I'm going to put in parentheses, that box minus that box, and I'm going to divide that by 7, and it gives me that number there, okay? Now, here's, here's why I think this is, this is really nice, because we got 30 pieces of data right now, okay? We might do this survey again or sample another 30 different GPS systems, and that data then changes, right? But if I construct this Excel sheet to where it's not based off specific values, but it's based off of the cells, then all I got to do is put in the data, okay, uh, the raw data, and all these calculations will automatically regenerate on their own. And I, and I have to essentially do this one time. And if I want to do it, again, I want to see a different sample, I just fill in the data and it automatically gives me all the information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually come back to this. And we always round our class widths up. That makes sense? So there's a function here. I'm going to go, I'm going to hit right in front of my equal, or right behind my equal sign. I'm going to type in round up. And there's a lot of functions here. Guys, I only know a, like a small smidgen of what you can do with Excel, okay, which is quite a bit of stuff. But it's still, there is so much stuff inside Excel that I don't know. So if there's something that I don't know, if there's a function I'm uncertain about, you see this one says when I, when I typed in round up, okay, you see where it says, what? My touch board doesn't work. Why did it do that? So it says number and then number of digits. Okay, so number is what I've got typed in here. This is what it's going to do. It's going to take this number, and I want to round it to the number of digits. Well, I want rounded to the whole number, so the number of digits would be zero. So it's talking about numbers after the decimal point. So I'm hit comma, and then zero, and I'll close my parentheses off. Okay. It also color codes things for you to make sure you see which parentheses kind of match up so you have enough of them. Um, so the black parentheses match up. Those are my function. And then the red parentheses are the actual difference of those things. And you see that it automatically rounds that up to 56. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? And okay, now that traditionally is maybe more work than what we would need to do if we were doing this by hand. But now it's set up to where if I want to do this again with another sample, all I got to do is put the data in, automatically creates my class width. What's nice, watch this. Let's say, so 59, 59 was my lowest value, right? Let me change that to 40 real quick. See how it automatically changes my class width? Okay, so that's the nice thing. Uh, I'm going to move back to 59, but that's the nice thing about using Excel the correct way, the way it was intended to be used, okay? So I'm gonna, that, that, that work right there is just like side scratch work um, that helps me decide what my class limits are going to be, okay? So on Friday, or I guess it was Thursday, when we said we were going to create our class lower limit, okay, we were going to put in there our lowest value, right? Okay? And you can do this several ways. You can look at the, the raw data and say, oh, well, the lowest value was 59 just by looking. Or can I hit equals and then min A2 to A31? And it automatically puts in there for me 
that 59. Puts in my lowest value. That's what we have to, so we always start our lower, the lowest low limit as the first piece of data, okay? Now we add to that, okay, so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna hit equals, because I wanna get this next limit, does that make sense? So I take the previous lower limit, and I'm gonna add to it now my class width. So I'm gonna, instead of, hit, instead of typing in the number five, six, I'm gonna actually hit C10 and hit enter because now I get 115 and that, that's 59 plus 56. But the reason I've done it that way is because now I can, and actually, well, I'm, I'm gonna do this real quick. I'm going to, you see when I put my cursor right here on the bottom right hand corner of that 115, you can see how it goes from that um, like block plus sign to just now a like a crosshair, right? When it goes to a crosshair, that means you're going to you can select the box, and then if you drag straight down, it's going to copy the formula that you have just created, and it's going to put it into these other cells. Okay. Now don't do this yet because we haven't got the correct formula. Because if I look at this, see how it just copies 115 all the way down. Okay. What that's doing is it's continually saying, okay, take B3 plus now. So, so when I did, so this was, I'm gonna click on, I double click on, you double click on a cell, it will show you the things, it'll highlight the cells that are being used in the formula. So when I click on that cell, it's taking B2 plus C10. So it's taking the 59 plus this one, add them together, and that's what's going into that cell. When I click on this one, it's taking B3, which is the previous class limit, and now it's adding to it C11. Well, what's in C11? Nothing, okay? If I hit enter, come down to this one, it's now going B4, which would have been the previous cell, the previous lower limit, and it's adding to it again, nothing, right? Do you see how I'm doing that? It, that red box keeps going one down lower. It's because of the way I copied my, my formula, okay? When you just type in a cell as like C10, and then you drag it, everything is... Um, constructed in respect to a location, okay? So as I drag it, it's going to continually move to the next cell. I don't want that C10 to go to C11 in the next block. I don't want it to go to C12. So the way we freeze that, the way we make this number static, is that we put a dollar sign in front of the C and a dollar sign after the C. And what that will do is to say, Whenever we drag now, that C10 stays C10 in the formulas instead of going to C11, C12, C13. So now I hit enter, and now I can drag that, and we get our, form, or we get our, our class lower limits, okay? Now I'm going to go a little bit further. I'm actually going to go down one more, and you'll see why here in a moment. But I go down to essentially what would be my eighth lower limit. Okay, and the reason I do that is because I need to be able to find my seventh upper limit. Okay, so I need to know what that value is. Do you remember how we find this upper limit here, this first upper limit? It should be, what do we do with that number right there? Because it should go 59 all the way up to 114, right? So I got to take what away from that number? This minus one in this case, right? So it gives me 114. Okay. Now, because I don't, I'm, I want this to copy. So what what I want to do is in this next block is I want to take the 171 minus one. And then in this block, I want one or 227 minus one. So I don't need static values. So I can just grab that right hand corner and pull it straight down. And now I've got my upper limits. And basically what that allowed me to do is subtract one time to get all of those 
upper limits. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, now, here's the reason I needed that 451. Because if I didn't have that 451, see what it does on my last one here? Okay. So, 451 there. Now, I know that's 450. Now, if you want to delete that one out, this is usually what I would do. I'm going to delete that. Uh, actually, let's just hit delete. And then come back in here and just type 450 for that one. Okay. There's, there's formulas that we could insert in that last cell to eliminate that, but it's, it's a little bit too messy. Is that all right? Okay. Now, what's nice about that, guys, is let's say that um, maybe we didn't want the class width to be 56. Maybe, um, you know, like the 70. What if that 70 was like a – or not the 70. What was it, 59? Let's say that 59 – was down to uh, 39. Hit enter, and you can see now all these class widths changed accordingly. Okay. Um, even if I wanted maybe six classes, now we get six different classes and different widths. Does that make sense? Okay. So we can adjust that stuff um, real nice if we if we set our our program up. Now, that's basically what we're making here is a, is a computer program to generate this information. Okay. How do I find midpoints? So I want to find the midpoint between these two upper and lower limits. If I had two numbers on a number line and I want to find the halfway point, what is one way of doing that? Okay, you can subtract them and divide by two. Now, what you, what would happen there? Let's let's see here, and I'll just I'll just write this real quick. So, if I subtract these two, so I'm going to say um, C2 minus B2, and then divide by two, it gives me 27.5. Now, is 27.5 is that a number halfway in between these? Okay, so what you did there is you found the distance between 114 and 59, and you cut that distance in half. So to actually find the middle point then, the middle point is 27 and a half units either to the right of 59 or 27 and a half units to the left of 114, right? So you could fix this by taking, um, you know, the 59, add 59 to that number, okay? Um, or... So we could plus then to this, that number there, and it gives me 86.5. And now I should be able to drag that down, and that should give me my midpoints, okay? Or the, the geometric way of finding a midpoint is to take the two endpoints, add them together, And divide by two. So it gives you the same 86.5. Drag down, and you see that those values didn't change. So those are those are two options for being able to write a formula for the midpoint. Okay. Um, all right. So the next part can be nasty. Okay. Um, and if we have only 30 pieces of raw data, we can go through that raw data column and just count. Okay. What values are between 59 and 114? How many of them are there? Okay. So you guys do that real quick. Go, go through the raw data um, and count how many belong in that first group, that first frequency. How many come up with? Five. Okay. So that's count, right? So think about this process, though. If that raw data column was a thousand terms, thousand points, would you want to count through all of them? Because the next step will be to go to the 115 through 170 classes and count all of them in that 1,000, right? So it can be very time-consuming if our if our uh, number of 
data but that come from our sample um, is much larger than 30. So what I'm going to do, now this, I'm, obviously I'm not saying that you need to memorize this stuff. And I'm not, guys, I'm not going to give you a test or a quiz, at least early on, that asks you really to do anything with Excel. I'll leave Excel up to you. You can use it. Okay, and I think there's a lot of things that you can kind of grab. Uh, are you going to be experts at this when we're done? No. Okay, but there are little tools that um, you will get used to being able to use that will benefit you not only in this class but other classes. Okay, um, if I want to count the frequency, so what I'm going to do there's a, there's a function, and when I I don't know if I mentioned this, but when I want to get into the function. So you guys have all done on your like TI-83 when you hit the math key and then you go to all these different functions that the math key operates with, right? Okay, so you guys have done it with all types of stuff on this calculator before. So I can hit like the math key and then these are all functions, right? So if I want to like round a number, okay, so if I go like 25 divided by 7, Okay, um, I don't know if that's even, I've never used that, so I don't know if that was working. Uh, but whatever these functions are, okay, I can write in, here's a min and max. I can write in my 30 pieces of data and ask it to find the mix, maximum and minimum values in there, okay? But I have to go to these certain keys on my calculator to find these functions, right? Same thing happens in Excel. The way that you ac access your functions is you have to hit the equal sign. And now it's either going to do calculations, if you just type in, like, using operations of adding, subtract, multiply, divide. Or if you start typing in words, you're going to be able to access some functions. So there is one function. It's called the count ifs function. Okay. Um, and this is based off, if you remember back to geometry, we talked about conditional statements. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to ask this thing to return a result if we can match up um, some conditions that show up in our raw data. So the first thing we need to do is we need to talk about the range of values that we're interested in. So our range is A2 to A31. That's, and it should highlight your data, your raw data. Okay. Now we are going to copy this formula and drag it down. And I always want to be referencing that raw data. I don't want it to move. So what we need to do is we need to go back in front of the A. And we need to put a dollar sign on both of these. We are then going to put a comma. in quotation marks. We're going to hit the greater than sign, so shift, and then the sign or the key right next to your question mark. And then we're going to hit equal. So, so what that says, that's the kind of the keyboard type of greater than or equal to. Does that make sense? And we're going to put that again. That's where we're going to close off our quotations. We're going to put a ampersand. That's what that sign, that and sign means, or that's what's called. And we're going to now type in the number that we're interested in. So we want to we want to go through this list and we want to count numbers that are bigger than 59. Does that make sense? So instead of typing in the number 59, what we're going to type in is we're going to reference this cell right here, so B2. So what it's going to do is it's going to go through and it's going to search through that list of raw data and it's going to count all of the numbers that are equal to or bigger than 59. Well, right now, if I, hit, if I close this off and hit enter, it's going to tell me back 30, right? Because all my numbers are equal to 59 or bigger. So that's the lowest value. So we need an upper range to kind of cut that down. So we're going to hit comma again. We're going to type in our 
array of data, so A2 to A31. I'm going to go back and put dollar signs on those. Okay, then we're going to hit comma, and now we're going to hit quotations. We want less than this time, equal to quotations. I'm going to hit my ampersand. When I do this, it's called um, concatenate. It's just the, it, it means I'm basically going to, with a less than sign, less than or equal to sign, I'm going to reference a value that is able to change and these cells uh, are able to change. So now I'm going to hit this cell here and that should be it. I should be able to close my parentheses, hit enter and it should put a five there. Now what's nice is I was paying the butt, right? Yeah. But we have it once. Okay. If I ever need to use that again, I've got reference of what it should look like. Okay. And all I've got to do is change the uh, the cells that I wanted to search. But since we have, now just think about doing this. That, that was long, and it might have been long for 30 pieces of data. But let's say I have 1,000 pieces of data. What would be longer? Going through my 1,000 pieces of data and counting 59 to 114, how many of them, tally them all up. And then do the same thing from 115 to 170, counting them all up, or, or tallying them all up, right? Or typing that in one time, dragging that straight down, and now it counted how many frequent or the frequency of each one of those inside those respective class widths. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Now, one thing, you know, obviously there are things here that I hope you grasp a little bit. Okay. But one of the main concepts I hope you grasp is that there are tools out there that make our lives so much more efficient if we learn how to use them. Okay. Now, if I want to do relative frequency, I'm going to hit equals. Okay. Now, let's do something here real quick. This is, this is one that you'll use quite a bit. So, I won't hit equals there. Let's come down to here. What should our frequency add up to? If we look at each of those for that frequency column, what should it total? Should equal 30. So, I'm going to hit equals and then sum. And that's going to select my... Cells. And you can see if I select my cells with my mouse or I could just type them E2 colon E8, it does the same thing. So I want to sum that array, close that off, and it does give me 30, right? Okay. Now there's a reason I would want that. Now if you guys, you guys might go back to, um, especially those of you that had me in college algebra, If I'm going to talk about the sum of something, you guys remember seeing this symbol? It's the Greek letter sigma, uppercase letter. It means summation. Okay. Um, so sometimes you'll see like summation F and equals 30. And that box right there, and all that means is the sum of your frequencies should equal 30. All right. Now, the reason I like that box here, especially with Excel, is because now if I want relative frequency, I'm going to hit equals. I'm going to hit that. E2 box. You want to divide it then by that box there, E9. Okay. Now, just think about what we've done already. If I hit enter and then drag into that next cell that is dragged into, that E9 is going to turn into E10. Does that make sense? The E2 is going to turn into E3. Now, if I think about that, I'm in the next cell, I do want E3 to be used. I want the 8 to be divided by 30 again, right? So what I need to do, I need that 30, I need that denominator to stay 30. So if you remember, the, the way we did that is we put number signs around the E. Now, if I hit Enter... Gives me one six. Now a lot of yours probably don't say one six, do they? Oh, they do. Okay. So I didn't. I formatted. So a lot of times, this is really what you usually have. If you were to open this, because I sent you this sheet, right? And I had some formatting of cells in the background. 
normally what would happen is that you would have that information show up, okay? It'd be in decimal form, which is fine, okay? But if you want a different format, you can select the, the table uh, cells that you want to format, and you right-click, you come down to where it says Format Cells, and you've got some options. I know it's kind of hard to see, but you've got options on how you want them to be represented. I'm going to click Fraction, and because my denominator is 30, I want to have fractions with two digits. You know, hit OK. You see that automatically then changes it to a fraction form. Okay. Cumulative frequency. Okay, this one's kind of nasty. Um, and I'm actually going to do this first when the values are decimal. And then I'll change them both back to fractions here in a minute. Um, but if you remember, cumulative frequency, all that means is that we want to take this cell here initially and it becomes this cell here does that make sense that's our first and our first class cumulative is just the relative fr frequency in that first class so i'm just going to hit that there okay now the next thing i want to do in this next cell i want to take the previous cumulative frequency and add it to 2.6667 does that make sense okay um, so what we're going to do is we're going to type in E two. Sorry, it'd be F two. See if I do this right. And we're going to colon that with this one. And I forgot to type sum in front, sorry. So type that and we'll see if see if this works. We're gonna hit enter. And that should add those two together, right? Now, the hope is that I've constructed this correctly, so when I drag this, it's going to take essentially that number there and add to it that number. So let's see if that happens. And it did. I should be able to keep doing that. When I get to this last row, this last cell, what should they add up to? They should add up to 1. And that's a formula that is essentially telling me take the current frequency, current relative frequency, and add it to all the relative frequencies before it. And then we can, if we want to, format that back into um, fractions, go two decimal places, and we see that that should add up to finally one. If we wanted to put a row here, or I don't want to say a cell here that says the sum of these from F2 to F7. Remember, our relative frequency should all add to 1, right? What did I do there? F2, it should be F8. Get them all in there, and we get 1 there. But now we've taken our raw data, and I never had to specifically go look at what the values were in the raw data. We're able to use these formulas that allowed the computer to search through my data for me. Does that make sense? And it makes things so much easier now. Let's say we we did that and now we get new data. And if I get new data, let's let's go through here and just kind of keep the class limits the same. Um, so I'm not going to mess with the 59 or the uh, 450 number. But let's say I change 90. Uh, let's say that became 54. Let's just say the 130 became 123. The 400 uh, was 432. And I can keep changing all of these, and you see then how the table changes respectively, right? You kind of undo them, hit Control Z. My Control Z doesn't want to ever work. Um, but I can undo them, and you can see in that last one, that was really the only one that really changed the. Uh, calculations on my on my chart because the other ones when I changed them I didn't 
just the way I changed them didn't pull them out of the frequencies that they were already in or the class widths that they were already in. Does that kind of make sense though? Now, again, disclaimer, are you gonna know all that stuff? We did this one time. Anybody an expert at this? No. So I've, I've been doing Excel since I was, since um, I took a class my freshman year in college and that's like basically the class was called op operational research. You guys remember doing questions like, uh, how do I, if, if I have like 200 feet of fence, how do I maximize the area by using certain lengths of that fence? I remember doing questions like that in Algebra 2, College Algebra. Um, they're called optimization problems. Okay, I took a class that was just designed around things like that. And instead of doing stuff by hand, the instructor made us do it with Excel. Okay? We didn't really have any background with Excel other than making rosters and stuff like that and organizing data by hand. Okay? It wasn't until that class and he started forcing us to actually learn some of these functions like the sum, um, the max, the min, uh, those types of things that I really started picking up on the, the, the niceness of Excel and how it can expedite a lot of our calculations, okay? Um, so when we, today when we, when we do this, will we ever, will I ever start you off from scratch and say, hey, make this distribution table out of um, this data with Excel? No, okay? And a lot of times, guys, I will probably, if we're gonna do this, I will probably kind of already create the formatting of the formulas and stuff like that for you, and we'll talk about them, but then we'll just use that um, information, the way that the, the program organizes our data so we can actually start talking about the statistics. Does that make sense? Okay, one of our formulas that we get to in chapter seven, or not seven, chapter two, it's section two seven, um, is, Standard deviation, which the formula for standard deviation is depending on a sample or we're using a population. It's one of these, one of these square root ones. Okay, uh, this is a sample, and this is using the population. Uh, but the way that we do that, and it gets it's really ugly like a formula, right? We create a chart, and we go through and we find actually all of those things in that chart. Okay, so we have to fill in those cells. We have to do the calculations in those cells by hand. And then once we have all that information in, the collection of that information then allows us to actually do this calculation in this box. Okay, and that will then give me the numerator. I divide that by n minus 1, which is the number of data points minus 1. And I take the square root of that. And that gives me my standard deviation. Okay, now that's a pain in the butt. If I asked you to do that with... 30 pieces of data, that's a pain in the butt. But if I look at Excel, I can hit equal, and I go standard deviation, I just type in STD, EV, and then dot S for sample, parenthesis, I'm gonna go A2 to A31, Excel does it for me, okay? And that allows us, that number will eventually allow us to tell how spread out our numbers are, okay? Um, how different one piece of data is from maybe the mean or something like that. Does that make sense? Okay, that becomes a very critical point. We will do it by hand, we will do standard deviation by hand, but when we get up to 30 points, that's a mess. 10 points is a mess. Five points is a mess, okay? Um, so if we have a, a research in which we've surveyed a thousand people, we want to be able to just type in the data and let a program do the standard deviation because the st getting the standard deviation is one thing, but interpreting it and using it, that's what the stats is going to be about, okay? Um, tomorrow, what I want you guys to do this evening, no new homework tonight, okay? What I want you guys to do this evening is look at section 1-4, read through it, okay? There's some vocabulary in there. Tomorrow, I'd like to talk about it a little bit. Um, talks about, like, the ethics of doing research. Talks about variables, confounding variables, lurking variables, that kind of stuff. Um, read through that. You don't have to take detailed notes on it, but I want you to have a little bit of a, an understanding of those terms before we get to class tomorrow.